Good luck, Luke. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining the weekly Greater Manchester briefing. And today it's also a budget uh, briefing, of course. Uh, pleased to be uh, joined by the chair of the Greater Manchester Local Enterprise Partnership, Lou Cordwell. We're hoping to be joined uh, by Sir Richard Lees for the health update, although Richard's having some uh, technical problems. So we'll see, uh, see how we get on. But let me start with a budget reaction. Of course, we're still going through uh, the detail, uh, all the supporting documents uh, to the budget. But let me give you a, a headline uh, reaction. Um, I would describe it as a packet of polos budget, in some ways refreshing, but also full of holes. Let me start with the refreshing part of it. It's clear the Chancellor has listened uh, in a number of ways to calls from myself, other mayors, uh, but also, of course, uh, business voices. We were pleased um, that the Chancellor responded positively to a call that I made earlier this year for the self-employed income support scheme to be extended to people who became newly self-employed on the eve of the pandemic. Um, and obviously it is welcome that they now can access that, uh, that support. It is welcome uh, that we're seeing the extension of furlough uh, through to September. That's a big boost for many industries in Greater Manchester, particularly Manchester Airport. Uh, and the aviation industry. We welcome the uh, continuation of VAT uh, at, a, at a lower rate. Uh, the business rates holiday, which we know will be so critically important to our hospitality industry in particular, and I'm sure Lou uh, will, will touch, on, touch on that. Also the extension of, of business grants. Pleased as well that the Chancellor responded to the near unanimous call across the country for uh, the uplift in universal credit to be uh, to be maintained, and we know that that will benefit uh, thousands of families across Greater Manchester. The right uh, thing to do, uh, and he deserves to be congratulated for it. Let me turn to the holes, though, if I may, because there were quite a number of holes in the Chancellor's uh, statement. An obvious one is uh, no mention of the NHS, or very little that mention of the NHS, and no mention of social care. Uh, almost a year into this pandemic to have a budget where no mention is made uh, of social care is is really a, a glaring omission and I think something of a uh, 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 an insult in some ways to social care staff who you know I think have been battling out there on very low pay um, and deserve more recognition of what they've been doing but also uh, more support going going forward and I, I believe strongly that this government should commit to a at least a real living wage for all social care staff uh, in England um, and will continue to, to call for that. Let me turn to some other holes in the budget. Self-isolation uh, support. I've described the lack of a workable uh, scheme as the biggest hole in Britain's defences as, as we look to the rest of this pandemic and the biggest risk to the roadmap. If this isn't fixed, particularly with new strains around, we could see those new strains enter the workplace if people aren't able to take the time off work that they that they need. Um, the continuation of the, the grant system of £500 payments isn't sufficient because, as we know, many people can't access that support due to the eligibility. So uh, we continue to call on the government to, to fix the system of self-isolation uh, support. I mentioned before that we were pleased the government had listened uh, on uh, the issue of people so far excluded from public support. Uh, and of course, they, they have gone some way, but it's only a relatively modest step of the way to closing all the, the gaps in support. All, although there are a lot of newly self-employed people in Greater Manchester, you know, the vast majority of the people who have been excluded are PAYE freelancers, people who are caught by the 50% the rule, uh, who are self-employed, uh, directors of small companies who pay themselves through dividends. I would imagine that they are feeling pretty dejected uh, tonight, uh, not to have had their plight recognised in the budget. And I would say to all of them that the fight will go on. We, we recognise you are in a desperate position and we will continue to support you, but certainly disappointing to say the least that the Chancellor didn't recognise them uh, today. In Greater Manchester terms, we, we estimate that 
a hundred thousand people are still in the category of excluded from public support. We think that figure has come down to 2.5 million nationally, but it's still 100,000 people in Greater Manchester, and that's a lot of people struggling. To say something about um, the um, uh, levelling up announcements in, in, the, uh, in, in the budget, it is noticeable to me, this is a, another whole, uh, that no mention was made of the phrase Northern Powerhouse. If you go back just a couple of years, it would have had multiple uh, mentions right throughout uh, the budget statement. And this is worrying because it seems as though the government is moving away from a strategic vision for the north of England with the strategic infrastructure investment needed to underpin that and going towards more localised investments scattered around and also moving away from promises of devolution towards relocating government departments as welcome as some of those moves are. It is important for us to say to the government that we were promised a strategic vision and accompanying investments for the North as part of that original Northern powerhouse vision. And, and it hasn't disappeared from our point of view. We were promised that, uh, and we were promised uh, by this government too, the, the investment in a Northern powerhouse rail system, uh, bringing the great cities of the North closer together. It's noticeable that that talk is, is, is dying down and we're, we're seeing more uh, low, uh, localised investments being uh, prioritised and that um, that needs to be challenged given that it's still the vision of a northern powerhouse that will not unlock most benefits uh, for uh, for the north uh, of England. Um, I have to say more broadly Greater Manchester has been making a case to the government for uh, the spending review as coming. We weren't particularly expecting uh, a, a great deal uh, from this budget but to the extent that we have benefited we welcome the uh, investment in Rochdale uh, through the through the towns fund that will be extremely welcome news to Rochdale Borough Council and it, it may also not be widely known but the port of Salford is linked to the Liverpool um, city region Freeport uh, proposal which got uh, got approved today and that's good news for the northwest of England but also good news particularly uh, for for Salford. Um, there is more to say, I'm sure, in the detail, uh, and we can pick up some of your thoughts in, uh, and questions uh, later on. But I am now going to hand over to the chair of the Greater Manchester LEP, Lou Cordwell. Lou. Thanks, Andy. Uh, so I, I thought um, before we, we just talk about um, kind of headline reaction to the budget, it might be useful just to share um, a, a wider kind of economic update by way of context on, on Greater Manchester and just share some of the latest data so, so that we can help to frame um, our thoughts and responses. So uh, we know that um, uh, nearly 140,000 residents uh, were claiming unemployment related um, benefits uh, in January. That That's a slight decrease, but overall uh, an over 80% growth uh, since March, um, and uh, but we're you know we're, we're slightly better than the UK average in that respect. Uh, we've got uh, 184,000 residents on fur furlough as of January. Um, again, that's an increase of 80,000 since October, uh, but again remains below uh, the 213,000 that we had in July. And we know through the growth company's um, latest business survey um, in the uh, the first part of February that the number of firms um, that are considering making redundancies has increased and that, that makes the furlough announcements today particularly important. So up to 5.6% from 26 in the previous two week period um, and actually nearly 13% of businesses had already made redundancies at that point. So um, uh, and then you know, 38% of the businesses in that survey um, are expecting the UK uh, recovery to take more than one year, but less than three. So that gives us some indication of where business confidence is at. And I, and I think really what we're looking at for today in those announcements is, uh, uh, is how um, how the initiatives uh, are uh, are working in terms of building back some of that business confidence that, that we know we need to get to. So. Um, obviously, in, in Greater Manchester, we'll talk very clearly about our economic vision, uh, and I think um, you know much much of what we're seeing in terms of where the recovery is going to come from is testament to the investments we've made previously in areas like digital. You know, the, we we are 
clearly the home to the future of retail and we're seeing that through some of the the large scale um tech giants that are being built through the hook group and ao.com and and all all out of the the region up here uh so uh, and actually green and sustainable and technology or you know the the green industrial revolution um sits right at the heart of our economic vision and and that's certainly one area that will come to in terms of our reaction so so Overall, you know, we remain confident through our vision about how we can contribute to economic recovery um, and the positives in the budget today. You know, it's good to see some support um, to uh, the roadmap and how we're going to begin to build back uh, and, and reopen in some of those sectors that we know have suffered most. And, and I think building that business confidence and some confidence that the roadmap is believable is incredibly important. And given the concerns around making redundancies, we know that the furlough extension is incredibly welcome. And actually, the overall view on the corporation tax solution, it was going to have to be addressed at some point. It feels pretty smart. You know, it's going to be um, pointed very firmly at, at uh, increasing 25 percent to to those that can most afford it. So over 250K. So um, that feels like a sensible solution. I think the big area for us that we'd hope to see perhaps more on and where we'll be hoping to work uh, with government over the coming months um, to, to see uh, more movement in that space is around uh, the importance of research and innovation um, in the economy and in particular um, green, which for us um, is going to play a really important part in our economic recovery over the next couple of years. Thanks very much indeed, Lou, and thank you so much for uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon uh, and for representing the Greater Manchester business uh, community. We are the fastest growing digital and tech hub in Europe. Uh, we do have uh, the most ambition, ambitious vision for a green uh, city region uh, in Greater Manchester, zero carbon by 2038, and we certainly look forward to the spending review and um, uh, the government recognising that a strong Greater Manchester needs to be at the heart of a northern powerhouse if that is to become a reality. And we look forward to, uh, to taking those conversations forward with them. If I could just turn to the health stats, uh, colleagues, uh, before we open up to your questions, it doesn't appear we've been able to uh, connect with uh, Sir Richard this afternoon. So let me um, just take you through the slides that um, Richard would have, uh, would have started with. If you could see the first uh, slide now, please. Uh, this is the seven day positive case rate. You'd be very familiar uh, with this. If we could go to that slide, please, Ross. I don't know if there's one second. Apologies. Thank you, uh, Jimmy. Uh, so um, you'll see the trend is is downwards across the board, uh, which is welcome, given that we'd had a couple of boroughs in recent weeks showing slight increases. So uh, a more encouraging set of figures uh, here, uh, particularly if you look at Berry that had gone up and now has come, come down significantly. Uh, so um, it's clear that the lockdown is working, although uh, those are uh, numbers that are still uh, quite high and much higher than we, we had last year. And we, we have to therefore remain cautious uh, in our approach uh, from, from here. And it's why I re-emphasize the point that the failure to fix self-isolation support does uh, put the roadmap at risk uh, from our point of view. And there's a missed opportunity today by the, by the Chancellor on that issue. If we could go to the next slide, please. This is the position in care homes. I think the way to describe this is stable. Um, obviously, um, much lower levels of infection than we uh, saw last year, but still uh, a cause uh, for some concern. And we continue to keep a close watch on that. Go to the next slide, please. Position in uh, the hospital system has improved um, significantly, um, is still uh, obviously uh, under significant uh, pressure. But if you look at the numbers on weekly admissions, uh, which are down quite significantly over the last couple of weeks to 125 from 193 a fortnight ago. Uh, and if you look at the uh, inpatient diagnoses, again, also down by 100 on, on the fortnight. 
um, that is beginning to show in reduced pressure on critical care with just over 100 patients uh, in critical care beds uh, this week and uh, a significant reduction as well of around 250 in the number of people uh, in, in acute hospital beds. Uh, so uh, an improving picture there, but as I've said, uh, and Sir Richard has said before, certainly one of still intense pressure uh, on, on the NHS and uh, we uh, continue to be grateful to all of our colleagues in the Greater Manchester NHS for managing us through this. They've coped admirably uh, with what has been thrown at them in the first two months of this year and we're extremely grateful to them and the Greater Manchester system overall has, has coped well with everything that has been thrown at it and uh, that is to its great credit. If we could move on please. So uh, more uh, positive news, um, getting close uh, now to um, uh, a million vaccines, we're 849,000 and you can see you can see the numbers. Um, continue to uh, press the government to uh, uh, get the supplies flowing, particularly to areas, communities like ours, where we have lower life expectancy, more people out at work. We want to get down those priority groups as quickly as possible um, and also to free up the mass vaccination centre for uh, younger younger age groups, which we think will also lead to a better use of capacity. But overall, it's still extremely good, good progress. And that figure of 91% um, take up amongst the over 70s is, is, a, is a great, great achievement. If I could finish um, on a last couple of slides around um, the fact that this year um, marks the uh, one year anniversary of the first uh, COVID-19 cases being detected in Greater Manchester uh, and we know that will bring back painful uh, memories for many of our many of our residents. 6,876 uh, people have sadly died from COVID-19 in Greater Manchester uh, over the last year and that of course uh, every single one of those people, every every number in that statistic, every person represents a, a person, a mum, a dad, a brother or a sister, someone's friend or work colleague or neighbour. Um, and we want to remind people that there is a place where all of those individual uh, souls can be remembered uh, lovingly um, and personally on the website that we've created, gmremembers.org.uk. And with this particular anniversary, we just wanted to um, uh, to bring that to people's attention. We are going to be holding a special service at Manchester Cathedral on the 23rd uh, of March. So it's a national call for a day of remembrance organised by Marie Curie, um, the charity, and we'll certainly be playing our part in that, uh, that day of remembrance. And finally, we know um, the longer we get into this um, pandemic, the harder it gets, but very much so for people who've who's lost, lost loved ones uh, along the way. The, as I say, the friends and relatives of those people that I was just talking about uh, a moment ago. So we just wanted, and we'd be grateful if you felt able to, to publicise this on your channels. Uh, the Greater Manchester Bereavement Service is available uh, to all of our uh, residents, and you can see the, the telephone number uh, displayed on the screen. So that's the Greater Manchester Bereavement Service. I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you again to Lou, uh, and I will hand back to Ross to take us through your questions today. Ross. Thanks very much, Andy. I'm um, going to take a question from Ashley at the Manchester Region News. It's a question for you, Andy. Um, have you decided what course of action you'll be taking following your comments at the weekend on the Jack Barnes Metrolink case? Uh, thank you. Is it uh, Ashley? Sorry, uh, Ross, I lost you then for a second. So... Apologies, it's Ashley. Uh, Ashley, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Ashley. I have to say, not not a a great deal to add at this stage. You know, I just will say what I said at the weekend. You know, at the centre of this is a very very tragic uh, incident and a and a grieving uh, family, um, somebody lost in very distressing circumstances, as I'm sure we all felt when we when we saw the uh, the scenes. When I, when I saw the, the the footage, you know. I, I certainly found it distressing and I think everybody would, would say this is not something that you would ever want to see on the streets of Greater Manchester, let alone live through as um, Jack's family has had to had to do. So while 
we hope that the uh, coroner's verdict offered some comfort uh, to them. Uh, we know it remains a, a distressing, a distressing time. Coron the coroner was unequivocal in his uh, ruling, and there there is potential for for ongoing uh, inquiries. And with that in mind, it isn't appropriate for me to say any more uh, on the case uh, this afternoon, other than there is the, that potential, and it's right that I'm mindful of that. Thanks, Andy. I'm um, going to take a question from uh, Nadine at Politics Joe. Um, she's asking, do you think the government are delivering on their 2019 manifesto promises to level up following today's budget? Do you think more should be uh, more support should have been provided for the North West, given it's been under harsher restrictions for longer than the rest of the country? Well, uh, thanks, Nadine. Um, yes, is the answer uh, to, to that. Leveling up needs to be a, as I was saying before, a, a North of England wide uh, endeavour. And it is the case that parts of the North West have been longer under restrictions than than anywhere else. And uh, some of the, um, the the need that we have here is greater. There has been a six fold increase in households in destitution uh, in, in the northwest of England over the last 12 months, a six fold increase, and that compares to a, a doubling nationally. So I've, I've cl it's clear what you are saying is true, that there has been a greater and disproportionate impact on the northwest of the of the pandemic. And it, it's why I am disappointed that the Chancellor didn't go further to support those people who've been excluded from public support, because still two and a half million people out there not supported, many of them living uh, in the northwest of England. The, the broader point is, you know, we've got to get back rather than picking one place over another. And you know, I'm always making this a sort of competitive situation, looking at a strategic plan to level up the north of England that starts with that major infrastructure investment, but also brings the investment in innovation that Lou Cordwell uh, was, was talking uh, about, a skill system to support the whole of the north uh, of England. And you know, I, I worry that the government slowly but surely is sort of pulling away from that. We saw the recent cuts to the Transport for the North budget, which uh, which give us cause uh, for concern. So, you know, you can't level up the country top down from Whitehall by just picking places almost at random. You need a, a strate strategic plan uh, for the north of England. You need devolution. Uh, of power to give more places the ability to do more for themselves. And, and I think the uh, the things that we were promised by George Osborne all those years ago are things that we are still waiting for. And, and I think the government needs to put real substance behind that phrase levelling up. And we didn't see that today. Uh, and we need to see it soon if this is to be a levelling up recovery from COVID. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Lou, did you want to take on that question at all? Yeah, I, I would just build on what, what Andy's um, saying there, which is, you know, the, there's the immediate support needed, you know, and, and that needs to be, regardless of geography, it needs to go to the places, obviously, that are hit the hardest, need a little bit more support, and, and we recognise that. We, we know that the long-term levelling up um, is going to come from planting the seeds um, of sustainable recovery using geographical strengths we're very clear on what our geographical strengths are and what our vision is and where our recovery is going to come from so we are uh, enthusiastic to work with government to make sure we make the most of the assets we have and the opportunities that are specific to greater manchester because we want to play our part in in getting the whole of the uk back on its feet um, and in the strongest possible position so you know we, we we've outlined that in our vision and i think a lot of our conversations moving forward are going to be about how we work together to to make that work for 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 greater britain as, as much as for greater manchester Thanks very much, Lou. Um, Andy, a question for you from Adam Clark at Roch Valley Radio. In today's budget, the Chancellor announced the Community Ownership Fund to ensure that communities across the UK can continue to benefit from the local facilities, uh, from local facilities and amenities. Berry North MP James Daly has said that he's planning a community bid for Gig Lane. He's hopeful that other local leaders will come to the table. I know you were involved in the rescue meetings in August 2019 when the club were expelled from the EFL. Is this something that you'd be going to, uh, going to support to get Big Lane back to being a great local asset? Yes, I, I will fully support James Daly uh, and uh, Eamon O'Brien, leader of Berry Council, 
uh, on this. Um, we need to make this a, a cross-party campaign. Gig Lane um, is an important part of Greater Manchester's football heritage, certainly Berry's uh, football heritage. We need uh, to do whatever we can to protect what is an important uh, community asset for future generations. So Adam, absolutely, I, I will support that. I welcome the idea of a community ownership fund, um, certainly as the home of the cooperative movement, as you, you will know, and Roch Valley Radio, you know, we, we are very keen to see um, more wealth um, uh, kept within our own communities in Greater Manchester and assets that matter up to our communities, as I said before, uh, protected. So we'll look at the detail of the Chancellor's uh, Community Ownership Fund. We had a cooperative commission uh, recently, uh, which looked at ideas such as designating cooperative zones within Greater Manchester, creating a unit within the growth company to, to promote the growth of co-ops and social enterprises. So yes, we'll, we'll, we're, we'll, we'll have a good look at this, but on the Berry case specifically, uh, and as somebody who's obviously a, a football person, I would not want to see Gig Lane uh, disappear. It's played a big part in our football memories here over many decades. I think we need to see a cross community, cross party campaign uh, to save it. And I'll certainly be working with James Daly on that. Thanks, Andy. And um, I'm going to take a quick uh, question from Richard Stead, but just to say currently this is the last question, and I know we've got quite a few colleagues um, uh, on the call. So if journalists do want to submit their questions, they should do that um, uh, around now so that we um, we don't finish early. Um, so Richard Stead from Radio Manchester asks, how will Port Salford be affected by being included in the successful Liverpool City Region Free Ports bid? Lou, do you want, did you want to say anything about that before I, I come in? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think um, generally there there is a very strong spirit of collaboration, not just between ourselves and Liverpool, but across the northwest. And I think we we we're all very um, cognizant of that project being a really good indication of how we've worked together across LEPs and across city regions um, to to shape uh, a proposition that we think um, is is great for Liverpool, but also great for us, and, and in particular Salford. So. From our perspective, delighted to see that news today because it's it's a good indication of how pan northwest collaboration and pan northern collaboration actually can work to, to the greater benefit. Thanks, Lou. Just on that question as well. Um, sorry, Andy. Uh, there's a there's a connected question um, just come in from Hannah Miller that I'm happy to to put now, or if you want to just answer Richards. Yes, I mean just to add to what Lou was saying, it's it's good when uh, the north of West of England collaborates as one, particularly the, the, the two big cities. I think there is more we can achieve and this uh, successful bid is, is evidence of that. I'm sure Mayor Paul Dennett and Salford City Council will be really pleased with this announcement today. Um, Greater Manchester, uh, obviously with all of the, um, the assets around the Ship Canal linking to Port Salford and the Port of Liverpool, I think it's an exciting uh, proposal. There is a downside risk that needs to be watched though is the only thing I would say in that free ports could uh, displace jobs rather than create jobs. We've got to make sure they, they create jobs rather than uh, take them from one place to another and um, have a destabilising effect. So that's just something to to watch but overall I think this is this is good news uh, for um, for the port of Salford and of course uh, the port of, port of Liverpool and I think we should be making more use of our great assets such as the Manchester Ship Canal and that's what the Freeport uh, will will do. Um, Hannah's asking to what extent will it bring better better jobs? Well we hope so uh, Hannah. Um, Freeports have been uh, tried before um, so I think it was the coalition government actually that um, that, that uh, cancelled the Freeport uh, scheme as was but of course the context is different now with Brexit and us being in a in a different trading uh, position. So I think there is an argument to look at this uh, policy again. What has to be watched is what I was saying before, that they could displace jobs rather than create jobs. And um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you know, we will work with our colleagues in Liverpool to make sure that that, that that doesn't happen. But Salford City Council have long had ambitions around Port Salford. This is a major boost for those, um, for those ambitions uh, today. We have supported them as Greater Manchester Combined Authority and the LEP, and um, we will uh, continue to, to proceed with this proposal, mindful of the, um, the potential risks. 
Thanks, Andy. The second part of Hannah's question is the Conservative vision seems to be that attracting private investment will create better jobs and growth in the North. Is that something you agree with? Of course, it's part of it is what I would say, um, Hannah. So, of course, we want to see greater business investment. And to be fair to the Chancellor, I think some of the uh, proposals he, he unveiled today around creating a stronger investment sorry, a stronger incentive for business investment uh, are welcome. And I, and I would imagine Lou might want to say something uh, about that because it has been a an issue that this country has struggled with at times to get businesses to invest alongside uh, public sector investment. But it, it can't be the only it can't be the only um, thing that we are uh, we're relying on to get the growth in the north of England that we, we need. It's going to have to be a public private uh, endeavor and we think the enabling investment often needs to come first from the from the public sector so take the green recovery that Lou Cordwell spoke about I think it will be for the public sector in many ways to get some of those green industries going if you take the idea of retrofitting of buildings it will be uh, the public buildings that might be retrofitted first before we then can build the industry uh, out and that's what we're planning to do in Greater Manchester, or if you take electric vehicle charging, it will be you know, the public investment that will first start uh, that that move. Um, we have plans to overhaul the public transport system in Greater Manchester. I'll be saying more about that in the coming coming weeks. And again, it will be the public investment uh, that, that kickstarts that. So while I welcome what the Chancellor uh, said today, and I also, to, to follow the, uh, the, the analogy I started with about it being refreshing in some ways, I think it was refreshing in saying that corporation tax for those that have made the biggest profits in recent times will have to uh, be raised to to recognise that, that there's, there's a contribution there that needs to be needs to be uh, re recaptured. So I, I think there were some refreshing parts of this uh, budget, but the holes were those big commitments to the strategic investment that the north of England uh, needs. And um, I hope they'll be uh, filled in the spending spending review. But the narrative is growing that this, you know, it's about a piecemeal approach to northern investment. And I think that 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 won't level up the north. It's as simple as that. They've got to get back to a strategic lifting all places together approach. Uh, otherwise, levelling up will fail. Thanks, Andy. Lou, did you want to come in on any parts of Hannah's question? Yeah, I think I think there's a there's a really important point here, isn't there, about how we're going to fund the economic recovery that we're going to have to drive. And, and the reality is, it, it can't all come from the public purse. And and as Andy's outlining, you know, and as we know very well in Greater Manchester, because we're very good at this, public private partnership will be the answer. I think it, it you know, and, and, you know, we talked before about um, the free ports, the, the reality of where our canal system came from took very strong private sector leadership and, and investment, you know, so so I think um, the the reality is it will be public and private together, but actually this idea of creating very investable places with clear propositions and a clear vision which is why it's important we, we in Greater Manchester do have our vision that that's very important because actually it's not just any investment you also want the right kind of investment and so so you know we 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 have a vision that makes it very clear about um, a fairer greener um, economic recovery and increasingly that's becoming very attractive to to larger proportions of, of the international investment community. So I think it's incredibly important that we as a place are investable and we have projects and initiatives that can be invested in because the reality is that's the only way we're going to do it at the pace we need to. Thanks, Lou. I'm going to go to a question um, from Joshi. I will try and come back to Nadine's question. We want to give everybody the chance to ask at least one. Uh, Joshi Herman at the Mill asks, a recent study by academics at three universities found that the move to remote working could seriously hurt the Manchester economy because of its reliance on commuters from other boroughs and the money they spend. Do you agree with that analysis? And do you think Manchester, and in particular its city centre areas, will lose out in the years ahead? Um, mm. Lou, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, gladly. Um, so, so I think it, you know, it is interesting to think about the role of cities and and the role of uh, in a place like Greater Manchester. You know, um, the the role that the the city of Manchester has played in in our in our kind of economic growth. I think um, cities will always play a really important part 
in establishing the pace and the dynamism and uh, and in this context, the, the recovery that lies ahead for us. But cities have also changed over time, historically, constantly, their dynamic moving places and the nature of what happens in cities, you know, and who lives in cities and what business goes on in cities is just a natural flux that takes place. So I think the difference with this one is we had 10 years worth of change in 10 months, so it feels particularly difficult and particularly painful. But the transitions that we're seeing in many cases were going to happen anyway. But there's some immediate pain points for some of those businesses that are being felt, as we know. I do actually think that the rhythm and the nature of work is going to change. You know, we're seeing that now we're going to see some more hybrid working. We're going to see some real opportunities for the boroughs, for high streets, for local place in the context of, of work. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, if we get the transport connectivity right and the digital connectivity right, those things can work and, and still leave us with thriving city centres, but also thriving local towns. So so I think, you know, we're, we're very optimistic if, if we get um, the connectivity right, that that can be an opportunity to make sure that we do level up across GM. Thanks. Um, Andy, did you want to come in on that one? Yeah. Um, I will come in, Ross, because it's a really good question from uh, Joshi and Lou and I uh, talk a lot about this. We were talking about it uh, yesterday. I think the idea that life's going to go back to as it was, I think we're all now accepting that isn't likely to happen and perhaps shouldn't happen because the great amount to commute was not something we all, uh, any of us particularly enjoyed. Um, I think there is uh, an argument for more balance um, in terms of the way people structure their working week, the way they move around. Um, and um, that could be to our to our benefit. Uh, Lou and I are talking about maybe more startup hubs in some of our some of our towns that people may choose to use to uh, work locally or co-working space, if you like, in some of our uh, in our towns, vacant retail space being converted. And people may choose there to work there for a couple of days, but then go into the city centre for a couple of days. So I don't think it's a binary um, kind of choice, Joshy, you know, city centre or towns. I think what we might see is a bit of a realignment that could work for the benefit of the whole place. And, and actually, that's what we're going to be working towards. As Lou said, a, you know, a reformed public transport system is going to be at the heart of this. Um, Prioritising public transport over the car, uh, linking our, our towns to the city centre so that people can have easier, uh, convenient uh, travel, uh, making progress on the clean air zone. There's a vision for Greater Manchester that I will set out in the next few weeks coming out of, of all of this and showing how we can kind of use it to, to reset things and, uh, and, and work in different ways, move in different ways, uh, promote activity across uh, all 10 boroughs of Greater Manchester. Uh, and I think we can probably get the balance, the balance right. It might be challenging, but I, I don't think we should fear it. I think we should see it as an opportunity. Thanks, Andy. Um, question um, from Jen Williams at the MEN to, to you. Uh, you mentioned that a lack of stronger uh, self-isolation support could put our place in the roadmap at risk. Are you saying that we may end up staying under measures if self-isolation support isn't dealt with by the government? Uh, and then I'll take a question to Lou after you've answered that, Andy. It, it is a risk, Jen, um, particularly with new strains around. You know, with so many people nationally, 20,000 not self-isolating every day, um, and that meaning that about 1,000 people in Greater Manchester not self-isolating every day, it's, it, it's a risk. And it's compounded by the fact that the HSE continue to see COVID-19 as a significant workplace issue, but not a serious workplace issue. Uh, and therefore, you've got, obviously, people going into work and not self-isolating um, combined with a, a lack of um, uh, the necessary focus on, on safe workplaces. I, we have some new stats for you, Jen. I don't know if it's going to cause Ross a problem for me to ask him to put the slide up, but you might just be interested in a slide that we have, which comes from the recent survey of Greater Manchester residents, because um, it, it fills things in a little more, and it is more than money. It is about practical help for people to self-isolate um, in terms of food and deliveries for people perhaps who are single. Um, it is about job protection. You know, do people have a job to go back to? We think this slide shows that it's a really complex, uh, complex uh, set of concerns that people have 
and that the you know they're not as the last bullet point uh, says there you know the large majority 90 percent who haven't self-isolated um i don't know if you can see that slide now um so they've partially done so and it's barriers to self-isolation that, that they cite rather than not wanting to do it uh, do it at all so this this comes from our latest insight uh, survey um one in five who've needed to fail to do so fully so obviously these are these are worrying figures um, and test trace uh, only works if the isolate part of it is dealt with uh, as well. And you know, we we are surprised there was no mention of it today. If you go back, there would be something in the budget today uh, on it. So surprised to find there was no mention of it at all. And the way I would describe it is it, this presents a risk in the places where the case rate is is, is highest. And um, we're seeing Greater Manchester again settling at a case rate that's above uh, England average um, and you know other parts of the north in that in that same position as well. That risk is is heightened by the emergence of the new of the new strains. And the government hasn't ruled out putting areas back under local restrictions. We um we, we just we just identify it as a risk. And it's a risk that's not gone away uh, because of what happened today and the failure to to fix the system. We need a comprehensive system of self isolation support to build more confidence behind the roadmap. And I'm surprised that the government continues uh, not to do that because it would be in its own interest, in my view, to fix self isolation support because it will then be making its own roadmap more watertight um, as we go forward. Thanks, Andy. And question for Lou, what specifically does the government need to be doing in order to stop the longer term structural problems we have faced here being compounded, compounded in by an uneven, by the, the uneven way the pandemic has played out? Apologies. So I think um, so some of that I think points to, uh, I suppose, there's a near field answer to that, which is, you know, we need to continue to to recognise those parts of the UK that are hit harder. I mean, we, we saw it in the last recession. We were hit harder and it took us longer to bounce back, you know, and uh, we need to learn from that and, and make sure that the support is given. And obviously we have a particular geographical um, makeup in terms of uh, the kind of business that's here, the kind of business that's suffering and the kind of business that's thriving. I think um, we're looking particularly for support then around the longer term transition. So the transition from those industries that are going to thrive and do very well and be a huge part of our future and transitioning workforces through skills into um, into those new industries, uh, but also, you know, support for the natural assets and the natural strengths of each of those regions uh, and making sure that that we can really capitalise on those and leverage those moving forward as part of economic recovery. So so we're from a GM perspective quite clear about what our plan is, where where we need to, you know, where we need to be driving our focus and our attention. And, and you know, a huge part of that is around a culture of innovation and, um, you know, allowing those existing businesses to pivot and change and be more digital and be more innovative in their culture. And, and actually, I think some of the budget does nod to that. Um, but some of that is about new business creation and businesses that don't even exist yet in sectors that hardly exist yet, making sure that we've got the right support mechanisms for that. So, so I think that the answer is going to remain some some near term recognition for the support that's needed just to keep business surviving and keep people in a job matched with um, a, a, a really good and um, strong conversation with, with us as a city region about how we enable the long term uh, growth and opportunity that, that we know is, is available to us. Thanks, Lou. Uh, a question from Stephen Kingston at the Salford Star. Uh, Andy, I'll put this one to you. Aren't free ports supposed to be a bad thing, read criminals, etc. Or have I got that wrong? Uh, not necessarily. Um, it's all about the small prints, isn't it, um, uh, Stephen? The risk of free ports is there. Well, one risk is that displacement of employment rather than creation, which I mentioned earlier. But another is um, if they create an environment where people can bypass regulation. Um, you know that that is something that potentially is a cause for concern. So it's the small print in the free port policy. 
uh, that we would want to look at. And I can absolutely assure you that uh, your city mayor in Salford will be looking at that small print as well. We wouldn't want to sign up to something that would create a backdoor to lower standards, obviously create risks of criminality or, or uh, anything that would um, you know, drive a coach and horses through um, uh, health and safety regulations or all those kind of things. What the idea is, is obviously to facilitate uh, trade and um, uh, ease of, of trade. Uh, so we are obviously interested in it. Port Salford, there's a very well-developed uh, plan there that the City Council have been working on for a long time. I think the linkage with Liverpool, as Lou Corbell was saying earlier, is a is potentially a positive one, you know, linking the Port of Liverpool with getting the container traffic into Port Salford and then on for onward distribution. You know, all of that is all of that is interesting. Could take some lorries off the roads, which which again sounds positive to me. Uh, but it will be the, the detail and exactly how it might work in practice. And there are downside risks that I think need to be watched. Thanks. Um, Lou, I'll move on to the next question unless you wanted to come in on that one. Fab. Um, question from uh, Lucy Tomlinson. It's been reported that Asda and Morrisons have said that they will not partake of the business release holiday. Would you encourage other supermarkets and businesses that have benefited from the pandemic to do the same? Andy, to you first. Yes, I would, Lucy. So it's a good question and I'll give you a straight answer. Yes, I, I would. And I think this is one of the frustrations I've got with the budget today. You know, what we saw last year when the Chancellor stood up schemes at, at, at kind of speed was that he, you know, in some ways there was an over provision for, for some companies who didn't need it and an under provision for uh, other people who really needed it, the excluded that I've talked about. And it was good to see supermarkets last year returning some of the business rates relief that they'd had uh, and it's good to hear today that uh, some companies are saying that they won't uh, they won't take um, the opportunity that, that now is in front of them but clearly some will and I, I guess the frustration is why the government didn't uh, target that a little more effectively and then use what they would have paid on the business rates to support some of those uh, 2.5 million people who are still excluded as we go along this journey, you would think the process should be let's get better at targeting where the gaps are and supporting people who've had had nothing. And I didn't hear enough of that, uh, if I'm honest, from the Chancellor today. There had been a there was a huge return of, of, of funds from the big supermarkets before Christmas, um, and you know that funding could have been used today to to be redirected and perhaps a more targeted business rates relief um, that wouldn't have created the opportunity. For companies who, who don't need it to, to, to take it. So um, yes is the answer to your uh, to your to your question. Um, but I you know I, I have to say um, the the campaign that has been built to support both excluded and forgotten um, that has got cross party support across the House of Commons, you know, for that largely to be ignored, I think will cause um, a deep sense of dejection uh, amongst many of the people who I've I've been listening to over recent recent weeks. I know how desperate uh, they they are. I'm concerned for them this evening. Uh, the only thing I can say to them is that we will continue to make the case for them to government. You know, it's simply not right that two and a half million of our fellow taxpayers have been completely frozen out of support schemes. Uh, it worries me, and I bet it would worry Lou that. There's a message that could be left hanging over the country at the end of this, that if you go it alone as somebody self-employed or a freelancer, you're taking too big a risk because you, you might just be completely left on your own, which has happened to a lot of people in this pandemic. I don't see how that's a, a pro-entrepreneurial message to leave out there at the end of at the end of the pandemic. And I'm surprised that the, the, that the Chancellor particularly has not moved to, to remove any risk of that. There had been a proposal put in called the Director's Income Support Scheme. So this was a support scheme for those directors of very small enterprises who pay themselves from dividends. And it seems to have been completely ignored as far as I can see. Would have been much better to focus the business rates relief and use the money that would otherwise have been used to, to pay for a full business rates relief on funding the uh, Director's Income Support Scheme. I'm surprised that these kind of targeted measures have not been taken today. Thanks, Andy. Lou, did you want to come in on that one? Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, you know, in, in brief, yes, it's really positive to, to see people take a lead, um, like we've seen with some of the big retailers today. I think 
you know, it isn't free money, it's support that's there for, for those who need it, you know, as Andy is outlining. And, and it does seem slightly strange that there must be, uh, there is a regularity of dialogue and there must be a good data set now that, that tells us which of, of those um, businesses do need that support and which, which are going to do just fine without it. So, so I think, you know, as we move forward with this, the more targeted we can get with that support. And, and as Andy says, the more therefore that frees up funds for those people that we know are still going to need um, support. You know, for example, our, our, you know, in Greater Manchester, we have an enormous freelance community. And then we see that across the culture sector, across the creative and digital sector, as, as many other places. And the reality is we do need those people to to continue to be able to be entrepreneurial and work for themselves so that um, as we move back into recovery, you know, they can fuel um, all of the, the services and, and those and those key industries that, that need um, their valuable talents. So, yeah, it, it would be good to see some of that get a little bit more targeted um, rather than just rely on goodwill, which is wonderful to see, um, but, but perhaps not the most targeted strategy. Thanks, Lou. And I think we've just got time for one final question um, for Andy, uh, just for one last one. It's Nadine from Politics Joe. Uh, Andy, what do you think about the fact that Sunak seems to be poaching a lot from Labour's 2019 manifesto, uh, so moving departments, green industrial revolution, etc.? Well, I'm, I'm sure that John McDonnell would have been watching today's uh, proceedings in the House of Commons with a wry a wry smile uh, on his face. Uh, I'm pretty certain that he was the first person ever to float the idea of Treasury uh, North. Um, but I guess I would say maybe they've taken what the 29 Manifesto was saying too much to heart because it was talking more about relocating national bodies and not doing enough to promote devolution uh, in the English regions. And I would I would certainly recommend uh, to the government, they need, they need to get back to a vision of devolution, places doing more for themselves, unlocking the potential and the power of a great city like Manchester, but also Liverpool, Leeds, simply relocating entities to work within them. It's, it's a good thing, don't get me wrong, but I think you will you, English cities will only punch their weight on the world stage when they are freed up to do more for themselves, where they've got the strategic infrastructure investment, the, the innovation investment, the skills investment, more power to direct it. And, you know, that is lacking in uh, in the Chancellor's, uh, the Chancellor's narrative at the moment. It's quite a centralist sort of top down statist sort of view that you level up by relocating government departments. I think you relocate, you level up actually by freeing up, liberating people at the local level putting more power in their hands. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm disappointed that we're not seeing a vision based, based around that. But um, there were many things, I think, that you know, National Infrastructure Bank, uh, Treasury North, as I said, a green industrial revolution. Um, yeah, I, I think they're, they're borrowing quite a lot from the manifesto they, uh, they derided at, at the time. And um, uh, I think one final point to, to make, one thing that I, I think we wouldn't uh, support was the freezing of the um, threshold on income tax at the lower lower level. Uh, I think you know that isn't something that anyone was calling for. Uh, it is uh, potentially going to uh, hit the least well off, uh, the hardest. Um, the chancellor made some reference at some point that you know he'd done most to help the, the lowest paid and those on lowest incomes. I don't think that is true, and I don't think freezing of income tax at the lower threshold does that. I think it will uh, disproportionately affect people on, on lower incomes. So um, he, he may have taken some ideas from Labour's 2019 manifesto, but he's certainly not taken all. But I, I would I would encourage both uh, main parties to, to buy in more to devolution, uh, because I think that is the true way to levelling up. Thanks, Andy. Um, that's us out of questions. Um, so unless you've got any, your lube, any final thoughts, that's us. No, Ross, I think um, we're sorry that Sir Richard could, couldn't join us uh, today. Technical problems, I I'm afraid. Uh, but thank you, everybody, uh, for your uh, for your questions. Hope you found that interesting and we will see you all next week. And thank you to you, Ross.